Sports. All right, welcome, welcome. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm hopefully gonna talk about stuff that is uplifting the future of where we're going in legal as well as it applies to the rest of the world. I think it's something that touches all of us, quite honestly. Uh, I am Joe Rosinski. I'm a technologist and futurist at Thomson Reuters. Uh, today we're talking about justice for all, the impact in, of AI and blockchain on legal. So what I first want to do is sort of open up the curtain to what's actually going to be happening, right? So I think you all have sort of talked about this maybe in other sessions, but I want to probably hammer it home just a little bit, right? So exponential technologies, they are unreal at this point in time to the extent that it's actually having an effect on all of us everywhere around the world and it's something that we all have to take notice of clearly right so what i want to do is talk about what it looks like right so we probably all have seen this in our childhood right so we saw this particular graphic of exponential growth and its impact on our lives but i want to take a step back and this is something from singularity university and the idea is this what does linear growth look like? Because that's what we're most familiar today with. Linear growth feels like this, right? So if I were to take simply 30 linear steps, I might make it from here to the back of the room. It's only about 30 yards, quite simply, right? Our brains have not changed in over 200 to 250,000 years. So physically, our brains have not changed but everything else around us has. So I did my DNA test, oh, about a year ago, and I have a grandmother that's far, far, far removed that grew up on the plains of Africa. And I think to myself, what did she know then? She knew her relatives, she knew her family, she knew where to hunt, where to gather. All these things were within reach. They were local, they were linear, right? And that's what we're still used to today, no question. But now if we're gonna apply that same example that I was talking about a few minutes ago to this example, what does exponential growth feel like? We're actually talking about something that's totally different, something that we're moving into. So if I were to take, again, 30 exponential steps, this actually takes me around the world 26 times. That's over one billion steps. And we all know what exponential looks like. So it's a doubling of every instance, right? So one, two, four, eight, 16, it continues to grow. Has anybody, has anybody, by a show of hands, seen a picture like this before of this? This gentleman has on his, around his ear, a simple device that has four sensors on it. It actually listens for what's going on in his mind. So he's actually able to communicate with any other IoT device out there right now. So we're at a point in time with this exponential growth that we have mind reading technology. To me, that's kind of frightening if you thought about a husband and wife and what they would have to go through, potentially if they both have these devices on, but that's an aside. This is the leap forward that we're starting to see, right? The next one that I wanna show is this. This actually came out last week, and this is something that is quite fascinating. You've all heard of, of course, of CRISPR, right? CRISPR is gene editing um, technology. But we're now at a point where they finally figured out something last week that they actually can carve into this helix and figure out exactly what can be replaced very easily so they can almost fix any genetic diseases. Again, this is the leap forwards that we're taking, right? So really quickly, printing of anything. So I'll talk about this in a, in a bit, but the future tools, so for food, as well as anything else you'd like to print will be available for people around the world in the next 10 years very easily and actually very inexpensively. Why is this happening? There are three distinct forces at play. The first force is infinite memory. So memory that used to be extremely expensive. The size of this stage, IBM had a computer this size, cost $165,000 in 1965, and it held five megabytes of RAM. Now we can go onto a website, we can simply get a chip the size of my fingernail, and it holds exponentially more amount memory, right? So we're at a point that it's growing really, really quickly. The second one is processing power. So processing power, we all have them, of course, on our computers, on our phones. It's getting faster and faster because of Moore's law, right? So we're at a point where on this graphic, and I'll get out of the way, on the x-axis, you have time. On the y-axis, you have calculations per second for a $1,000 computer. What does that mean? It means that when you bought a computer in 2001 for $1,000, it processes as fast as simply a NAT. Fast forward to 2009, it looked like a new $1,000 computer would process as fast as a rat's brain. 
Fast forwarding roughly 2020 to 2022, you're looking at a brand new computer will process as fast as a human's brain. Now, when we're looking at the timeline, 2040 to 2044, you're looking at a brand new $1,000 computer will process as fast as all of mankind projected to be 8 billion people. So unlimited memory, unlimited processing power, and now AI. Now, we hear about AI way too much in the legal space, about how it's gonna take people's jobs, how it's gonna affect our lives. Some of that might be true further in the distance, but right now it's enabling people to do things that they never had the chance to do before. We're starting to see this cascade up and down all over the world. So I'm gonna start talking about that right now. So I had 100,000 miles of travel last year, for better or for worse. Um, I loved it, I loved to travel, I went all over the world. One of the places I stopped off at was Nepal. And one of the things that I'm noticing everywhere I go um, is that everyone is moving in the direction of having a phone, right? So everyone has a cell phone or moving in that right direction. These two gentlemen had their phones. They were smiling as they were taking their picture and they put it away like, ah, you shouldn't catch me with my phone. Good for them, but they basically, they had phones. And then when I traveled to Colombia, same sort of things, remote areas, people had phones. As well as Cambodia, villages that I went out into Cambodia, kids would gather around the phone, they would use the phone for games, or whatever the case is, that was accessible, that was available to them. Same thing in India, as well as all over Africa. So we're seeing these computers, essentially, in everyone's pocket. We're moving in that direction, which is an incredibly positive thing for everyone because there's lots of things that we can do with these, clearly. So it's the democratization of technology that we're talking about. What does that mean? It means that ah, the original cell phone that they developed, I think in the US, uh, cost $4,500. It, it took 10 hours to charge and had 60 minutes of talk time. Now you can actually go online, you can buy a cheaper cell phone for 50 cents to a dollar. Now if you're able to cascade that to everyone, people have access to a computer in their pocket, it has a major impact. To the extent that how does legal AI now impact people's lives? Well, in this first example that I'm, that I'm showing, it's more of something you see in the US and perhaps in the UK, but it's the first chatbot that resonated for people. This will also start to cascade in other directions too. So a chatbot clearly is something you can pull up on your phone and interact to try to find a particular decision that you want to make, right? So in this instance, it is if any one of us got a parking ticket outside or a speeding ticket in the US, you actually pull up this particular do not pay app and you submit a picture of your ticket, you say what jurisdiction it's in, and then it, the AI, will look at it to determine if there are any irregularities and so it could get it dismissed for you, right? That was the first one. Now, we're starting to move in another direction, and Thomson Reuters has an application that works in this sort of space called Contract Express. It's a decision tree mechanism that allows you to do things. This is VisaBot, right? So you can imagine if someone needs a visa for a particular country, they can actually go onto this bot, and they can go through the decision tree of where do we want to go? How much time do you have to do this? And it starts to work you through that process. So someone who's not educated in this space can now do this. If I need to do this, I could go to this website. It's fantastic. Another one from Australia talks about non-disclosure agreements. So if you think about a smaller company that's trying to develop uh, anywhere around the world and they need assistance in, with legal technology, they'll be able to go to a site like this. These types of tools are becoming much more readily available and easy to build. So they are there for the masses, quite honestly. Legal digital identity. You may or may not have heard about this a little bit over the course of this week. I spent a lot of time on this. So the World Bank actually cites that one billion people do not have access to legally recognized form of identity. That's a significant issue. If you don't have an identity, if it's not seen, it's not known, you can't prove it, then you're gonna have some significant problems, no question. As you can see, 60% uh, is lower income, majority of women, not a good scenario for anyone. With your phone, we are working, with Thomson Reuters is working on coming up with sort of a self-sovereign identity. And what does this mean? It means that a government can now leapfrog technology that we've had to use in the past with databases that are a little more clunky, difficult to work with, to a self-sovereign identity that basically works on the backbone of a blockchain. So it's immutable. You're able to prove who you are. So 
The government actually issues you a private key and a public key. You hold on to both. And when you want to verify who you are or where you are, or where you're supposed to be going, you simply show them that. Again, a new direction that we're starting to see take off in different parts of the world at this point in time. Not only are we talking about digital identity being used to help prove who you are, to give yourself the ability to potentially own land, uh, to have a deed. So we're moving to a direction of a digital wallet on your phone. So not only will it have um, your birth certificate information, uh, you'll have your deeds to your property, you'll have login information, the things that you traditionally use. Governments will also take advantage of this in a, in a, many, in a good way. So we, what we think about here is if you're about to buy something, you can actually have real-time VAT taxes sent to the government rather than having to have put the onus on the particular company who's collected and then process this sort of thing. So we're moving to a direction where it'll automatically send the money to the specific government agency who's collecting those taxes, making it much easier for people to actually deal with these types of things. So there's also an area of legal automation tools that I wanted to talk about. This one is... Uh, Kind of interesting, I, I came up with this one, uh, this example, probably three or four years ago. I've been the blockchain, for better or for worse, since 2011 uh, with Bitcoin. But this is the most fascinating thing for me when it comes to artificial intelligence and blockchain and how they all start to work together. It's all around a smart contract. I'm sure that you all know what a smart contract is, but I'm just going to go through this really quickly. So let's perhaps guess that one or two of you in this room are uh, lawyers. I'm sure many of you are. And you had to, someone comes up to you and says, hey, can you please create a will for me? Uh, and you're like, sure. So you would normally pull up your computer. You might type out the particular will. And this will is super strange. And I apologize for this in advance. But the will says this. It says, upon the parent's death, they have two kids. Or sorry, their parents have two kids. Upon their death, um, both kids have to be married in order for them to split the estate. If one kid is married and one kid is not, the kid that's married gets 100% of the estate. Super bizarre, right? So what they end up doing is they write this up and then it's codified. By codified, I'm not asking you to go through this code, but I'll walk you through it. This is the smart contract that's stored on the blockchain that basically says, what are we looking at? We're looking at specific triggers. The first trigger is every day, check to see if the parents are alive, yes or no. One day it comes back and it says, ah, both are dead, unfortunately, right? But it's heartless, so it goes on to the next task. The next task is quite simply verifying whether or not both are married. It says one is married and one is not. And for the sake of argument, basically all the assets are liquid and it transfers all that money to the person that has been married and they're able to prove that because it's on the blockchain, it's part of their digital identity. This clearly is more of a complex example, but this is a direction we're starting to see things go. So if you're talking about if-then statements on the blockchain that are proving something, this is what we're going to start to see. So how is this working right now in the real world? All right, so in Sri Lanka, they just finished this. In Africa, I know they're starting to work on this in many different places. So this is a smart contract that they're starting to work on. I'll call her Alice. She has this beautiful plot of land that she farms with her family, right? It's not a huge plot but it's very precious to her, it's something that means a lot to her. It's her survival. She needs to farm this land and then sell some of it, right? So the big concern for her is if there's a drought or something happens, right? So what she's now able to do is pull up her phone and opt into a particular insurance program that says, I own this plot of land. You know, God forbid if there is a drought or something happens that I could get paid out on that. So. It's stored on the blockchain. She knows that she has access to that. And then through the power of AI, they have satellites that are going over her property and they, are, they do determine that there is a drought. So what happens? Immediately, money is transferred to her on her phone to cover that insurance claim. Pretty cool stuff that they're starting to work on right now. Another space that I think is also really neat is um, Thompson Reuters works with a lot of startups, works with a lot of incubators, and one of the neat ones that we have is working with Claros. And they deal, and they're from Argentina, they work with dispute resolution. And this is the idea that clearly it's difficult in some parts of the world to get access to justice, right? To get to the courts. Maybe it's two or three hours away. Maybe it um, takes two or three years to even get a case heard. This allows Alice, let's talk about Alice again, where she pulls up her phone and anytime she works with somebody, 
in a particular space, she's actually able to do that contract on her phone. So in this instance, she needs the seeds. It's spring, she needs the seeds to plant uh, her farm, her crops. Um, so she opens up her phone, she works with the individual who's selling those particular seeds. It's stored on the blockchain, so it's safe, it's secure, it's verifiable. But unfortunately, Alice has a problem. The seeds didn't come in in time. So what can she do? Normally, she'd probably be out of luck. But with this, there's actually a way of hitting dispute resolution through this AI, through this blockchain-enabled way. And you have arbitrators that sort of voluntarily come into this, but they can also get paid for it. But the arbitrators basically look at the, the case. So Alice presents her information. She says, this is my case. So does the seed provider. Ultimately, you have arbitrators. It starts off with three. Um, if there is an issue with those three and both parties don't agree to it, then it goes to appeal. And you can go to five or to seven arbitrators to actually look at that. But this is all being stored on the blockchain. And at some point, Alice wins. So Alice gets paid as well as the arbitrators who also did the work on this too. This is a direction I think that we're moving in that I think is very, very positive in many different respects. So one of the last things that I wanted to talk about is the importance of, I guess, data and, and everything else beyond that when I talk about differentiators for AI. So fundamentally we're talking about groups that specialize in legal technology or technology being given to people around the world there are three major components. Artificial intelligence and the expertise of the algorithms is clearly a huge one. Domain expertise, so having legal experts understanding the local rules, the regulations, the laws, all of that as well. But one of the biggest things to help people is data, having the right data given to the right people in the right time. So tech vendors are traditionally within the AI space, startups are in both, and then there's a lot of good partners out there that are also working in all three. So, in conclusion, what I wanted to say is that this is truly a special time. I think that the processes that we have in place, the technology that's starting to surface from bottom to top, top to bottom, is actually having an impact on people's lives. Thomson Reuters has been in uh, business for over 100 years in 100 countries. We work with startups. We have 1,500 pro bono attorneys around the world working with NGOs to try to make things as, as, as great as possible for those in need. And we do have 75 data scientists working as, as well. Yeah.